Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so I'll be talking about a couple of papers, which is a, a joint work with a lot of other authors uh, who are shown on this page. Um, so two of these papers are published, one at ICCV last year and one is just <coughs> freshly out for CVPR this year. And they are all about extending random fields uh, to become more expressive models and ultimately also to uh, make progress in tough computer vision applications. Um, so why random fields? Random fields have a big history in computer vision, uh, almost three decades or three decades and more. Um, and recently, around 10 years ago, um, conditional random fields have appeared and I would say for many of the hard structured labeling tasks such as pose estimation, uh, semantic image segmentation, image segmentation, depth estimation, optical flow, these now uh, more or less define the state of the arts with different trade of, offs regarding performance and runtime. Um, and what all these tasks have in common is that we want to make structured predictions. So ultimately <coughs> given an image we want to make predictions of multiple variables uh, jointly. Um, so the current state of the art in computer vision is still uh, a little bit disappointing um, because people spend a lot of time on their unary terms if they use a random field. They spend a the time boosting uh, classifiers using SVMs, using kernels, using uh, uh, decision trees, uh, all kinds of fancy models for the unaries. And then when it comes to the pairwise term, they just pick one out of five well-known terms, have one or two parameters and tune them using cross-validation. Uh, and that's a little bit disappointing because uh, the real structure of the model happens in the pairwise term, not in the unary. Um, so in the ICCV paper, we basically show a more flexible version of the CRF, where we overcome uh, this restrictive form, um, and we overcome the reason why the restrictive form has been used in the past, which is basically the difficulty of estimating the parameters. So if you choose a flexible form for the pairwise potential, it becomes very hard um, to actually set the parameters here, to set the functional form of these interactions. Uh, so people use something like contrast-sensitive smoothing potentials, and there's one parameter which you can tune. But if you use, say, a neural network to define the interaction, it becomes very hard to estimate these parameters. Um, especially if you say, instead of just a pairwise interaction one pixel away, you would allow interactions a couple of pixels away, it becomes a lot less clear how to intuitively set these parameters. So you cannot just reason, we want to smooth our prediction, like you do for the contrast-sensitive potential, but suddenly here it's no longer so clear what, you, what the interaction really should do. Or if you have a third-order potential, only in very restrictive applications you can make the point for, say, enforcing curvature, enforcing second-order smoothness. But if you, in general, allow third-order interactions, it becomes a lot, lot less clear how to, how to set these interactions. Um, and so what we did in the ICCV work is essentially offer two things. Offer a flexible representation using decision trees. So here's, for example, a pairwise interaction. There are two random variables and x is the observed image. And we have to find the functional form of an energy function defined for the two random variables and the, the image we observe. And how we do this is by using, um, by using a decision tree uh, and we store at the leaves of the decision tree, we actually store a small table and the table is addressing uh, for every possible combination of these two random variables the actual energy values. So what we do is then we observe an image patch associated with this interaction, we go down the decision tree and then we instantiate that energy table as effective interaction in the model. So what this is going to do is, although the decision tree is shared in the entire model and repeatedly used in the entire model, because the image is different at each place where the interaction is used, we end up at different leaf nodes. Okay, so it's basically a very complex way of tying parameters globally in our model. Um, and it's very efficient at test time. At test time, we just evaluate the trees, and then we have a normal CRF problem. Um, so this is just a normal CRF, essentially, with a very flexible form for the interaction. And this extends to unary uh, interactions, pairwise interactions, and any other higher order interactions. Of course, it becomes more complicated to store these tables. Um, so this generalizes the unary random forest you normally see and people use these, right? It's just a model without pairwise interactions. Uh, it generalizes random forest. It's just a tree that has a depth one. It doesn't make any test based on the image. It always has a single interaction here. It's no tree. 
Um, and of course, it, uh, the more flexible ideas and to have a tree for these interactions and then the model becomes really imp uh, expressive. Um, the key problem we addressed in the ICCV paper was how to actually learn these models. So that's the reason why people have not used more expressive interactions before. And essentially, we, we use a very old <coughs> technique. We just use a so-called pseudo-likelihood approximation, which is essentially, um, if this is our random field model, we take a single random variable and we condition it on its Markov blanket. And we do this for every random variable and just treat these, um, we condition using the ground truths. So basically, here we have some labeled ground truths in the training data. We instantiate it, and it now becomes a small conditional model, which is tractable and very efficiently computable. That was the, the key idea, very simple. Um, but moreover, besides just the simplicity and efficiency, it allows us also to use huge training sets because we can suddenly subsample structured models. So if we have a model with a million pixels, we can take for an image of a million pixels, we can just take a random sample of a thousand pixels from that model, use a pseudo likelihood approximation only for these thousand pixels, and obtain an unbiased estimator for the pseudo likelihood of the entire training set. Um, so this is very efficient at training time. Uh, however, in the ICCV paper, we had only very small scale applications, and they were sort of a little bit contrived to show that the model is really uh, expressive and can model certain structures. So we had the task we made up Chinese character in painting. So you're given a Chinese character, but there's an occluding box, and you need to in paint. You need to remove the gray box. So this is really difficult because you have binary random variables, and you need to model things like stroke width. You need to model preferences for horizontal and vertical strokes, which happen in Chinese characters. So it's, it's a quite challenging task. Um, and actually, if you see, uh, the MRF basically does just some intelligence smoothing. It's a very densely connected MRF, so it's not a simple MRF. Um, but the decision tree field, it can do more meaningful completions. So uh, that's nice, but it's sort of an artificial task. Um, we also, Jamie provided his data to us, and we uh, basically showed that by modeling this conditional pairwise interactions, uh, we can gain improvements there. And for example, here the structure on the arm is better modeled. And this is just because you have weak local evidence. So if you observe a depth image and you observe the arm like this, and you just observe basically a patch here, you don't know where on the arm you are. But if you have a random field, you can propagate this information. So you can say, I don't know what I am, but if this is a shoulder and this is a hand, I know I'm the elbow, basically. Um, so performance increases. Uh, training is efficient. So even though we have a couple of million model parameters, we can estimate them from, this was 1,500 images uh, quite efficiently. Uh, and this is all nice, but uh, after the ICV paper, we were excited about the model, but disappointed with some other aspects. And the next part of the talk is basically about addressing these aspects. So um, in the ICCV paper, we train these decision trees and the weights, these tables we have in the leaves independently, which is not very satisfying. Right? We learn the tree structure, and then only at the end we, we take into account all the model interactions when we learn these weights. <coughs> um, so ideally, we would like to learn it jointly. The tree structure and the weights of the model should all respect the overall model. Um, we use a pseudo likelihood approximation. I think we got away with it, but it's, it's, uh, we got criticized in reviews for, for using this. Um, but I think the, more, um, the most uh, problematic aspect is we have solved the training problem, but the test problem is quite difficult. So for these Chinese characters, for a 100 by 100 model with 300,000 edges, it takes like 20 to 30 seconds to do inference, which is just much too slow. And now I show how to all overcome this these problems. And this is the CVPR paper we have this year. So the first thing is we, uh, we replace a model, the discrete random field, with a continuous one, and a very specific continuous one, a Gaussian CRF. So a Gaussian conditional random field. That means we can do efficient inference. Efficient inference by just solving a sparse linear system of equations. And this can be done by conjugate gradient, 50 iterations uh, in real time, essentially. Um, we are going to do joint training. So we are going to use, uh, train the tree structure that defines the model by using a single objective function. So every decision in the model, splitting the trees, which feature test to use, what are the parameters in the nodes, is made in order to minimize a single objective function. And that single objective function is no longer the pseudo likelihood. It is really an estimate of the, uh, it is the empirical risk of the training set. So we do empirical risk minimization. And by using different loss functions, we can optimize for different losses. But the basic idea stays the same. We still have trees, we still have interactions, we still do tests on the images, and depending on where we reach, a leaf, we have a leaf model, and this leaf model defines an energy function. 
This is all the same. But now the energy function is no longer a table, it's just really a function. Okay? It's a, sp a specific function, it's a quadratic form. Quadratic form with a positive semi-definite matrix Q and some linear term uh, which depends on some basis function and some weighting matrix. The basis function could be, for example, filter responses. So we basically have a linear quadratic model in each leaf of the tree. And every interaction is going to select one of these uh, small quadratic forms. And we piece them together by just summing them, and this defines a whole quadratic form for the entire image. And this is a Gaussian, the Gaussian uh, energy, the conditional random field. Um, at every pixel, we now have a vector in RD. For example, for denoising, we will have uh, D equals 1, but for colorization, we will have D equals 3, or for other applications, optical flow, we would have D equals 2. So this is completely free to choose. Uh, we are going to do joint training. I'm not going into the details here, but the, um, we found joint training to be really useful. So what we are going to do is, when we grow these trees, we again use a greedy strategy, like Antonio showed, but we select the test by which to split the data in order to maximize the decrease in the objective function. And the objective function is really the empirical risk. And this makes a difference. So we, we can see here, for example, if we train them separately, independently, this is a blue curve, we reduce the error much slower than if we, use a, um, if we directly train for the loss. And so um, it eventually flattens out, but we essentially make much more effective use of the training data. And this is on the test data. So these curves are on the test data. It's not on the training data. Um, and we show that this is efficiently computable for any differentiable loss function. So this is another technical contribution in this paper. We show um, essentially that the entire computation needed um, amounts to computing some sufficient statistic locally and then just using the sufficient statistics. So it's, it's still as efficient as before. Uh, we have some applications in the CVPR paper, joint detection and, uh, and regression for these deformable registration tasks, colorization of grayscale images, Again, I would say, to be fair, it's a little bit like the ICCV paper. We show how flexible the model is. We show that it can do quite fancy stuff. Um, but there is not a killer application, so to say. So we said, OK, for ECCV, you have to do a killer application. We have to solve a computer vision task. Okay. <laughs> um, and the computer vision task we solve, I would say, is image denoising. So image denoising is a crowded field, basically dates back uh, to decades. Um, and there are a couple of benchmark methods that we <coughs> compare against. So. Um, there's a locally sparse coding. Um, uh, you probably know this. Uh, there's a recent work of uh, Yeah Weiss and uh, I don't know his first name, Zoran. Uh, ICCV last year, the expected patch likelihood. Um, basically, these are on par with each other and the state of the art approaches. And there's a little bit older approach, BM3D, which is also really good. And these are really state of the art, and they are sort of more principled Markov random field based methods, a field of experts, but uh, unfortunately, they don't perform so well in practice. Um, so now the interesting thing for image denoising is, if you take all these uh, best performing methods, okay, and you have a noisy image, and you, you, given the knowledge of the ground truths, per pixel independently, you choose the best prediction. So you cheat basically, you know the ground truths, you have these four predictions from the different methods, you pick the ground truths, per, uh, you pick the, the best performing model per pixel, you still have a residual, so these methods are not, not really perfect. Um, the denoised image looks great, right? It has to improve on every single method, of course. But now the really interesting thing is if you look at which pixel have you, for which pixel have you selected which model of these four, you see some structure. And you see some structure, some regions are really noisy, it's almost random which model you pick. And some other parts of the image, there are some consistent patches where you prefer one method over the other, right? And so this is encouraging in two ways. The first way is in these very random parts, you can probably profit by just averaging these models because the residuals are likely uncorrelated. So model averaging could improve performance there. In the patchy areas, you could improve by finding out, trying to predict which model is better. So if you find these consistent patterns given the image, you can actually improve. Um, so this is one of the motivations of, of how we actually get good denoising methods. The other one is, I said, we can optimize for different losses. So for image denoising, there are different uh, losses, uh, peak signal to noise ratio, mean absolute error, uh, structured similarity, information weighted structured similarity, all kinds of different errors, and we can all optimize for them explicitly. So we can, I think it's the first time that somebody can explicitly optimize a model with many parameters, like millions of parameters, for predicting well in structured similarity. 
So when we do this, and this is a structured noise model, so it's not additive Gauss, uh, Gaussian white noise, but it's a structured noise like dust on the lens, we can learn to remove it using for optimizing for structured similarity, and we can learn to remove it for mean squared error. And depending on what we optimize for, we are better in the respective performance measure. So this is a test image. Um, and this is encouraging because it says the loss matters. If you want to be good at PSNR, you better optimize for PSNR. If you want to be good for structure similarity, you better optimize for structure similarity. And all the existing denoising methods, correct me if I'm wrong, don't explicitly optimize for loss. They propose an algorithm and then <coughs> basically measure different losses, but they don't optimize for that loss. This is another contribution. We use a very solid experimental setup, also because people previously have just evaluated on 60 or 68 images over and over again. They give the individual images even names. Um, and this is not a pr proper experimental setup. So we used a proper experimental setup over different noise levels using clear training validation test separation. We use statistical hypothesis tests to prove that our results are significant. We evaluate on the test set only once, once only. Um, and we use different features. We use filter bank responses, but also in some of the models I will show you, you, we use the outputs of the other denoising methods. Because we have a conditional model, we can do so. We can just plug the outputs of other models in. Yeah? Do you synthesize the noise? Uh, yes, we synthesize. So this is, we basically have different settings. So the, I find the more interesting setting the structured noise setting, right? Because other approaches could not address that easily. And we can learn the noise model, the perceptual similarity metric, and the natural image statistic model. So we can all jointly learn this. So this is, I think, the contribution. But this, for this experiment, just to be comparable, we use additive, untruncated, white Gaussian, pixel independent noise. So like the most analytic thing you can write down. Um, this is a result table. Uh, let me show you the, the zoom up here. We basically perform, outperform every other method <coughs> over all noise levels in PSNR by 0.25 dB, which is huge. Um, and so we have two methods. Basically, RTF all is using all the other predicted outputs from the other methods as features. But this is really slow because field of experts basically takes uh, 15 minutes per image. Uh, so we also have one where just BM3D uses, uh, used as input. And even that is outperforming the other approaches significantly. If you just take the uniform average of all these four methods, you also improve on each. So this is the first point I made uh, of the averaging effect. Um, and actually, we outperform all methods on all the performance measures, so PSNR, mean absolute error, structured similarity, on every of the 200 test images. So on every image and every performance measure, we are better than any other baseline method. Uh, visually, is this EPLL the best performing method for this image? I think you can quickly see, even on the screen here, that, this, that our prediction is better. It's smoother, where uh, EPLL is patchy. Okay. Did you try on the, the real noise? Yes, we tried on, on, we have JPEG deblocking experiments and we have uh, a simulation, synthetic noise of dust on the lens, so like a, a bigger occluding noise. But I mean just uh, like, uh, you know, um, real noise that's not JPEG or whatever, right. the fact that you know, it's, not, it's not Gaussian. Right, so um, the approach is based, right, heavily based on learning and machine learning. So we would need, in order to do this on, say, real chromatic noise from a webcam or something, we would have to use pairs of ground truths and noisy images, which are probably easy to create by just increasing their exposure time. We're actually working on this for other applications, so, but not in this experiment. So we really wanted to just close that pixel-independent noise chapter. Um, uh, okay, so this is basically almost it. Just the reason for why we actually improve the loss function matters. We can optimize for the loss function. Um, and we can make use of all the existing denoising methods, so it's future-proof. In case you come up with a new denoising method, we just add it to our model, and I'm pretty confident we'll beat your method. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, a recursive argument. But um, yeah, we, we, we make clever use. We weight the existing methods image dependently, and then correct the residual. Um, so now we have the best of both worlds, right? We have a new state of the art in image denoising. We have every efficiency. We have the joint training. We can optimize for the loss. And uh, we are very excited about this. And thank you very much for your attention. I think we have one minute for questions. Anyone? Otherwise, we can go straight to lunch.
What's left to do for any of us? <laughs> What's left to do? So, <laughs> okay. So, the reason why this is efficient is that it's a Gaussian model, right? Um, but there are real computer vision tasks which are just ambiguous. So, given the image, the true conditional distribution, the predictive distribution, is not unimodal. And in our model, it always is guaranteed to be unimodal. So there is, we are, our model is still misspecified in these scenarios. I don't think denoising is one of these settings. Um, but there are probably others, other settings like optical flow. Say, think of a zebra strip on the, on the street. You can either match left or right, so there is some ambiguity. And um, I think in, in true multimodal settings, we would have to extend from a quadratic energy function to maybe a more flexible model, which of course would be a trade-off again in terms of can we do inference in it? Can we do the parameter learning in it? Um, but promising. So that's left to do. There are a lot of other things left to do. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them I, I keep to myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>